Thank you for joining today's session. This session is entitled Maximizing Your Social Security Benefits, Perks and Pitfalls to Be Aware of to Get All You Deserve. Our presenter today is Elizabeth Horn, DLCV Senior Disability Rights Advocate. She has been with the DLCV for about 10 years and she's a subject matter expert in social security benefits. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping rules we'd like to address. Speakers, please remember that we are using live captioning and interpreting services. When you first introduce yourself today, whether it is as a speaker or as a participant later on, please include a physical description of yourself and your preferred pronouns, such as I'm a white person with faded pink hair and glasses. I'm wearing a green hoodie and have a blue background. Any pronouns are fine. This will help provide context for attendees who may be blind or vision impaired and will also help our interpreters and captioners locate who is speaking on the screen. Please stay muted at all times unless you are the speaker and please hold all questions until the end. We do have a chat box that will be monitored by the moderators. Chat box is used for questions only or as directed by the session speakers. At the end of each session, moderators will select some questions from the chat box. If your question is chosen, you may take yourself off of mute and ask your question or simply type your question in the question box. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. And hello again. Uh, this is Elizabeth Horn, and I've been with DLCV quite a while. Um, and as Jessica mentioned, I work in the area of Social Security disability benefits, which can be quite vital to a person who has a disability. Um, and so she's mentioned my title, and I do want to stress that um, this is mainly designed for individuals who already have social security disability benefits. However, if you don't have them yet, but are perhaps applying for them, you should feel free to stay with the session because you will have a lot to learn. And, um, and I, I think you'll appreciate being here. Um, so uh, just to identify myself, I am a um, older individual with silver hair. I am a white woman. Uh, I'm wearing a turquoise top and uh, any pronouns are fine for me. So let's um, begin with, I, I do wanna make sure you understand what we're gonna cover today. Um, I wanna start by letting you know some of the acronyms that I'll be using. Um, the first one is always SSA, which of course means Social Security Administration. And so I'll say that or sometimes just Social Security. That is the uh, federal uh, agency that provides these benefits that I'm talking about. One of their uh, disability benefit programs is known as SSDI. It's also referred to as disability. And uh, it's for people who have worked and quote unquote paid into the system. Uh, the next acronym I might use is SSI, which stands for Supplemental Security Income. And this benefit program is designed mainly for people who lack um, credits for the worker program or who may have a low worker program benefit. And so you can actually have both. Um, it's also for children um, who need an SSI benefit and are dependent on uh, parental income. I'll also talk about the two associated healthcare programs, one being Medicare, which is associated with people who have SSDI, and then Medicaid, which is a healthcare coverage for people who have um, SSI. And again, you can have both. So let's quickly talk about what you're gonna learn about today. I've, I've identified perks, which are benefits and extra things that come along with your disability benefits. And then I'm talking about pitfalls, things that can go awry uh, as you um, uh, receive and, and, and have this benefit in place. Um, the first benefit perk, of course, is that Medicaid comes with SSI. Um, we're gonna talk about Medi the Medicare Savings Program, which are perks that come along when you're on SSDI. We're gonna talk about the ticket to work. We're gonna talk about employment supports, which are also referred to as work incentives and the need for benefit planning. And those are for people who wanna work while maintaining a benefit. And then if we have time, and we may not, I'd like to touch on disability benefits 
versus collecting early. This is for older individuals who are approaching the retirement age, but have uh, disabilities uh, that are developing or well in place. And they're trying to decide between the two. The pitfalls I wanna to cover today are understanding income and resources, which can be a concern when you are an SSI beneficiary. Um, and because these can lead to what are called overpayments of benefit. And so we're gonna talk about some of the things that are involved with that. We're also gonna talk about the SSI one third reduction, which can occur when you're not contributing to the household. Um, and again, that's for SSI. We're gonna talk about the pitfall of neglecting to keep your disability well documented for the inevitable review that will come. And then also neglecting to inform SSA of any changes to your address, resources, and so on. And the last one being neglecting to obtain benefits planning when you decide to work. So let's start with the perks. Those are the happy things that, that happen when you're on one of these benefits. Um, the perk number one is with SSI, and that is that, as I've mentioned, it comes automatically with Medicaid uh, or health insurance called Medicaid. And it also comes with home and community supports. So let's talk a little bit more about that. When you qualify for SSI, you automatically qualify for Medicaid. Keep in mind, you do have to enroll in it. It doesn't just show up uh, as a card in the mail when you get SSI, you have to sign up for it. Okay, and you do that at the link here, uh, commonhelp.virginia.gov, and there's a phone number as well. Um, once you have this Medicaid, which uh, is considered to be full Medicaid, has all the bells and whistles uh, that you could possibly need. And it entitles you to what are called long-term support services and home and community-based waivers. So if somebody needed a nursing home, for example, it would, it would likely pay for that. On the other hand, if they prefer to live in the community in their home, uh, then it has what are called home and community-based waivers. So instead of living in an institutional setting, you can live at home with the supports coming into your home. This is an outstanding benefit of uh, being a Medicaid and of course an SSI recipient. Also with Medicaid, there are very few copays unless you have other income. Um, but they're really quite low. Some, some people have no outside ex expenditure. The other thing with Medicaid and SSI is, is that Medicaid or SSI is what ties you to Medicaid. Your, your SSI can fluctuate up and down depending on your income from other sources and your resources. But even if you have a dollar of SSI, you are still connected to Medicaid, okay? The other wonderful little known program I wanna to mention to you all is called the HIPP program, H-I-P-P. -P, and it stands for the uh, Health Insurance Payment Program. It's a beautiful program that allows a individual who's on Medicaid, but who is also on their parents' employer's insurance. Instead of using the Medicaid benefit available to them, they can simply use the employer benefit that they have through their parent, but Medicaid will actually pay the premium for the health insurance through the employer for both the disabled individual as well as the family. So this could be hundreds of dollars of reimbursement each month just for using that employer-based insurance. I encourage you to look into it. It's an outstanding perk. And again, it's very little known. The link is right there to it and it's easy to use. They have a great uh, administrator. Now, benefit perk number two 
is related to SSDI, the worker program. And that comes with uh, health insurance, of course, Medicare. And with that comes potentially the Medicare savings program, which we're gonna talk about now. So as I mentioned, Medicare is automatic if you have SSDI. However, there are two really big uh, caveats. One is that it, can it takes two years for the Medicare to kick in. It's a two year waiting period. And that's on top of a five month waiting period for the benefit. Um, the other thing is Medicare only covers 80% of your healthcare costs. And so you need a supplement such as Medicaid, for example, or Medigap, or you've heard of Medicare Advantage plans, which older people, uh, retirees have. Um, but I'm, I'm mentioning this as a perk because for quite a few people who receive SSDI and have Medicare, if their income limits are low enough with, with the benefit, they can qualify for this Medicare savings program. Now, I do have to stop because I've just told you there's a 24 plus five month waiting period for Medicare to kick in. So what are you gonna do for 29 months, right? Without healthcare and a disability. Um, the first thing is I'm gonna tell you about the Medicare savings program, which could fill this, this gap. But the second thing is we have a guide on our webpage on social security called, do you have a disability and need healthcare? And it had, because you may not qualify for the Medicare savings program, we'll make sure you know whether you do or you don't today. But if you don't, this guide will tell you where to get health insurance until your Medicare kicks in, okay? It's very important as a disability benefit recipient to maintain health insurance for two reasons. One is you don't want to decline, obviously. You, you, you may need, oftentimes need, medical help, um, treatment, medications, procedures, whatever, um, so you don't decline. But the other reason is that you need to keep your disability documented for a review that will occur down the road. And I think we're going to be talking about that review so you know what to pre pre prepare for. So we're gonna focus right now on Medicare savings program when you are on SSDI. I've given you the link right before the title of this slide, right or right below it. And so you can go and search there and find out how things work and not have to try and remember all this. Let's start by saying that if your SSDI benefit is less than $1,660, right now, this is 2023, you will qualify for some or all of the Medicare savings program. The less your monthly payment is, the more you'll qualify for. There's also a resource limit on this of $9,090. Okay, so if you're a Medicaid recipient, and let's say you have a 401k that's worth, you know, uh, $8,000 in the bank, you're okay. But it, when you, once you get over 1990, I don't think you will qualify for it, okay? And then keep in mind, this amount of 660 and the other amounts I'm gonna share with you go up every year due to cost of living increases. And if you have been on SSI or SSDI right along, then you know your benefit goes up every January. And that's, that's the raises that I'm talking about. So don't, don't get hung up exactly on what I've listed here. Okay, so let's start with the tier one for the Medicare savings program. If your SSDI benefit is currently under $1,235 a month, you will qualify for tier one. 
And tier one is actually called the Qualified Medicare Beneficiary or QMB. Don't get hung up on the acronym. What you will receive with this perk is that Medicaid will cover your Medicare Part B premium right? It's currently $165 approximately. Um, in other words, you have to pay something, you know, to have the insurance. It's called a premium. And with this perk, you will not have to pay for that. It will not be reduced um, from your benefit. Secondly, you will have access to a, a very good prescription drug coverage program called Extra Health. It's inexpensive medications, and you'll never pay more than currently $4.30 per prescription, and that's for brand names. Generic medications are typically no more than $1.39. Again, those are 2023 amounts. Those could go up um, a little bit in the coming year. The other wonderful perk with this tier one QMB is that Medicaid will pay for your Medicare deductibles, co-insurance and co-payments. In just a slide or two ago, I mentioned that Medicare only covers 80% of your healthcare costs. So there's a giant gap there of 20% and you don't wanna be left with that large bill. So you need that coverage. This is what Medicaid will cover for you if your benefit is under $1,235 currently. These are three wonderful perks. Um, and specifically, you know, sometimes in order to access a, health, a service, there is a deductible with Medicare, like $200 before they'll start paying. Medicaid will cover it. Let's say there's a co-insurance, like if you go to the emergency room, they make you share the cost. Medicaid will cover that additional cost. And then co-pays, for example, everybody has co-pays when they have employer insurance, when they go to the doctor or get a, get a test done. Those co-pays are covered by Medicaid. So really everything else that Medicare doesn't cover, Medicaid will. This is a very robust and generous program and basically equals full health care coverage uh, with no premium. Now, moving on, um, I do want to mention that with QMB or that tier one, um, you'll also qualify for what's called dual eligible because you, you're you you qualify for Medicare and Medicaid, and they have what are called special needs plans. And these plans are uh, coordinated for your healthcare needs. And I've given you the link there to that. In fact, you'll get a lot of mail about joining the, the special needs plan or the SNP. Um, but these plans include the following usually. They include dental, okay? They also include a healthy living card. It's just like a credit card. You take it to the store and it'll actually pay for healthy foods, I think up to about $75 a month. And at the end of each month, it simply reloads and you have that to use toward healthy foods. Now, you're not gonna be able to buy candy bars with it, <laughs> but there's a huge range of healthy foods you can purchase with it. Um, the other thing it comes with is um, this isn't a card per se. I think it's part of your health insurance card that you'll get. And it's, it pays additionally for things like over-the-counter uh, medications like Tylenol and, you know, uh, inhalers and things like that. Um, but it might also cover hygiene products, things that you would get at a pharmacy, okay? It also covers things like utilities. I've heard of people paying their water bill or their utility bill with it, with what's left over. And I think you get about $400 a quarter, okay? Now these can change from year to year. So you, you need to be on top of the mail that you get that describes what's going on. And the last perk when you are in this tier 
is usually a gym membership somewhere close. Lots of gyms participate with this, okay? And so there's no cost to that. So as you can see, there are a lot of these perks um, for people who, whose benefit is under the 1235. Now let's talk about what if it's over 1235, but up to $1,478 now. Okay, and again, that's a 2023 amount. This is called tier two, specified low income Medicaid, Medicare beneficiary. And for those of you who are between those two amounts, you still get your Medicaid, or excuse me, your Medicare Part B premium paid for. Again, that's $165 you will not have to pay to keep Medicare. Um, you will also have access to the prescription program I told you about, where you'll pay in th this case, no more than $10.35 a prescription. It's a little higher. And that would be for a brand. Uh, I think the generic might be about $4 that you would pay, no more than that. But you have to note within this tier, um, you are not getting the rest of that Medicaid coverage, okay? The co-pays, the co-insurance, the deductibles, all that whole amount of funding that covers that 20% that Medicare does not cover. So in this case, you need to find additional coverage because again, Medicare is only gonna cover 80% of any Medicare. So we're, I'm gonna give you some ideas on how to get that coverage, um, but let's right now turn to tier three. It's the last tier in the medical savings program. This tier is called a qualified individual. And in this case, it's for people whose benefit is between $1,479 and $1,660. Again, currently 2023 numbers. In this case, they will continue to cover your Part B premium, that 165 that covers, uh, the, the, that gives you Medicare. It will not come out of your check. However, you do not now have access to extra health prescription coverage or to that Medicaid coverage that helps with the 20%. Okay, all that, um, you will not have access to, access to. And thing to be aware of is, is that through these annual cost of living increases that occur to your benefit, you may go from one tier to the next. And if that happens, you could begin losing some of these perks. And that's when you wanna be in touch with ways to make up for them, okay? So again, if you, if you lose the Medicaid health insurance portion of the coverage, then you're gonna need a secondary plan. And that's what we're gonna talk about briefly now. There's an organization in Virginia called VICAP or Virginia Insurance Counseling and Assistance Program. This program is free, it's unbiased, confidential, Medicare insurance counseling. This is where you can go and get qualified information without having to get swamped by letters in the mail or people calling you on the phone, hassling you to sign up with their latest, greatest Medicare plan. This is where you can get straightforward, unbiased, explanations of the various possibilities so you can carve out a plan that works for you. Like if you're used to those card perks, you know, that pay for some of your over-the-counter medications and, and hygiene products, you want a plan that may include some of that. And there, there are likely plans that, that have that right in them and that have no premium. In fact, if you can't afford a premium, you have to tell them that so they find a program where that's possible. So VICAP is a great opportunity for you. It's free, 
and it's here in Virginia, and it's manned by trained volunteers. I've given you the email address, their phone number, and if you happen to have a hearing or speech impairment, you can use the free Virginia Relay telephone service. Okay, now perk number three has to do with employment supports. So we're moving away from insurance and into the, the world of work. And you're wondering what's the connection between being on disability and working? Well, there can be a huge connection. Many, many people who are on disability benefits also work. And the beauty of it is that SSA has designed what are called employment supports that will help you test your ability to work. And these are designed for people on both SSDI and people on SSI. So let's talk about these. Now, by the way, employment supports are also known as work incentives. So, so they're interchangeable. And they are basically designed to protect your cash benefit, whatever that is monthly, and the health insurance program you have while you would test your ability to work. Um, so before I say much more, I want you to know there's a SSA publication on this called Working While Disabled, and they will give you their official information about that, okay? Um, I think the other thing I wanna make clear is, is that these employment supports, um, some are strictly for people on SSDI, Others are strictly for people on SSI, and some are for people who are on both programs. So we're gonna start with the SSDI employment supports. So keep in mind, if you're on SSI only, this does not apply to you, but I'll get to the employment supports that do. The SSI, Work incentives or employment supports provide you help over a long period of time. As I said, to help you test your ability to work um, or you know, to just continue working. Okay, let's say you've gotten to a place where you, you are capable now of 30 hours of work a week. Well, there's rules and supports that might make kick, may kick in for that. Um, they also help you become gradually self-sufficient. So maybe you need to build up your stamina for work and more work and more work. And now eventually you can work 40 hours and you're making a decent wage. And so you sort of work your way off the benefit. And that's okay, but there are some safety nets if you become disabled again. So there's some protection there. In fact, if you were to play out these employment supports, they could potentially help someone for nine years while they're testing their ability to work. And you know, when you think about it, the average person, you know, they they don't just find their work niche right away. They they need to try things out and figure out what works for them. This is especially true for a person who um has become disabled and now they're having to work with a different set of abilities and uh, limitations. And so they got to figure it out. So it takes time and social security recognizes that. That's why these supports are in place. So this is kind of a graphic that will help you understand some of the key supports. Keep in mind that while you're using these supports, your Medicare, and your Medicare savings program, if you're on it, um, are intact, okay? It, it, it stays right with you. The first um, of the supports is called the nine month trial work period. This is when you start earning over 1,050 a month, and that's gross. You know, those gross wages before any taxes are taken out. During those nine months, which don't have to be consecutive, they can take place over a couple of years or more, actually five years. You get to keep your SSDI, 
and all of your earnings. So let's say, you know, you went back to work and you were earning $25,000 a year, $2,000 a month. You keep that along with your SSDI. But now when you hit the nine month mark, and again, that, that may occur within nine consecutive months, or it could occur over several years, but whenever the ninth month is hit, you enter a new stage with the work supports. That stage is called your extended period of eligibility. And it lasts 36 months. Now, during that 36 months, each month your earnings fall under a particular limit which right now is $1,470 a month gross, um, you, will you will keep your benefit that month. You'll keep your earnings and your SSDI check. But any month that you go over the, the limit of 1470 gross a month, you do not get your benefit. And people, you know, typically or oftentimes with disabilities, they, 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 their condition waxes and wanes. Maybe they have work that's accommodating and they, they can take a month off to recuperate from, from a surgery that, that they need and then go back. So there's many reasons why this might occur. The point is it protects you for those months you simply can't reach that threshold of $1,470. Again, that's a 2023 figure. It'll go up in the new year. At the end of the 36 month extended period of eligibility, you enter a new stage. And that stage is called your expedited reinstatement period. And it lasts for five years. At the end of your that 36 month period, if you can consistently sustain earnings over the 1470 amount, your benefit will end. They actually give you two more months. It's, a, it's called a grace period. And then I think one more month on top of that, the benefit ends. But during this five-year period, let's say you have an exacerbation of your disability the disability you were originally approved for, not, not a brand new one, your benefit can be reinstated without a new application. Now, sometimes you may need some documentation of this to show what happened, but essentially it, the benefit kicks back in. That's a huge protection. Many of you know how long it took you to get the benefit to begin with. So you don't wanna to have to go through that. And what I neglected to say was the opposite is at the end of that three-year period, if you consistently remain under the 1470 amount, you keep your benefit for those, th for those 36 months, okay, for the whole time. But again, at the end of the 36 months, it ends, but you're protected with this five-year reinstatement period and your Medicare continues, all, all of the things equal. Now, we've talked a lot about these amounts, staying above, staying below, whatever happens, but I need to tell you there's other employment supports um, that can impact that. Um, whoops. Oh, okay, we're gonna skip. Uh, to SSI employment supports, and then talk about the ones that impact both benefits. SSI supported um, or employment supports work differently than SSDI. This is a program where once you receive SSI, your disability payments continue until you medically recover. And um, you know, assuming you, you continue to meet the income and resource limits. When you work, for every dollar you earn, they're going to take away 50 cents, or every $2, they'll take away a dollar. So if you earn $500 in a month, 
they're going to take $250 off of your SSI check. They'll reduce it. So you have to be reporting your income to Social Security every month so they know whether to reduce it or not, or if so, by how much, because your wages could change from month to month. So, um, but the point is they're not taking away the whole $500. So you're still ahead and that, that we think of that as a, as a perk, okay? Uh, the earnings get too high to about $1,650 a month, you may actually lose your SSI benefit because you've kind of reached a, a threshold. But your eligibility for Medicaid may continue while you're working. Now, um, again, in most cases, if you're unable to con continue working consistently due to your disability, your benefits can be reinstated without a new application, okay? All right, so these are the three benefits. Um, that you can think about that are employment supports. One is impairment related work expenses, whether you're SSI or SSDI. This is where you have an expense that you have to incur in order to work. It could be the cost of, um, gosh, it could be the cost of um, transportation. Maybe you can't drive and need to get to work through specialized transportation or it could include the costs that you have with a service animal that you need to work, or a medical device, or some kind of a uh, uh, durable medical supply, something like that. Those are costs that will come off. So using the $500 scenario on SSI I mentioned, let's say you're spending $100 a month on these impairment related work expenses. Now, in the eyes of Social Security, you're only earning $400. So now they're only going to reduce your SSI by 200, not 250. Okay. And with SSDI, it sort of works similarly because you're still having to, you know, deal with thresholds and they'll take off the money you're spending on these supports. Now, plan to achieve self support is a more complicated support of, uh, or employment support, but it has to do with creating a plan that is intended for you um, to reach a work goal. And it could be that you have to spend money on supplies like a laptop or a, maybe you have a, a, um, a business goal and you need a laptop and you need a, a vehicle and you, know, you need supplies. So you work and pay for those supplies now they don't view that work as income and that, that will positively impact your SSI and SSDI, okay? Um, also subsidies and special conditions are where your employer you know, allows you to do less than the job really calls for, or you have a coach like a job coach and there's a cost associated with that. All of those will change the whole um, financial way your um, benefits are, are counted and, and the supports are calculated. Um, I'm gonna give you um, a uh, book at the end of this. It's a booklet actually, uh, and the link to it that will help you understand all of these more. Turning now to the Ticket to Work, this is a program that is no cost optional. It allows you to um, you know, think about going back to work and getting help to do so. And it gives you a lot of choices of where you get those supports. Um, and I've given you the link to the services here in, in um, you know, about Ticket to Work and, and how to find those. Um, and then uh, I, I think I want to mention to you one of the most important benefits of being in the Ticket to Work if, if you decide to sign up for that. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, a key is that if you're in the Ticket to Work program, which means that you're working toward an employment goal and you're using uh, services to get there, um, this continuing medical review will not occur during that time period. So let's say you were set up for one next year, it won't occur while you're engaged with this other activity. It's, it's quite a nice benefit because it gives you more time uh, to work toward becoming um, employed. Okay. 
Um, the book that I mentioned to you is called The Red Book. It's a fabulous uh, document that's very easy to understand uh, in plain language. I um, wanted to, uh, it explains all of the, the um, employment supports, work incentives, and so on. And um, these are the ways you can connect to it. It's on Social Security's webpage at ssa.gov slash redbook. And there's a PDF version, uh, an electronic version online, Spanish version, you can order it in print version. Um, and there's even alternative formats you can order. So go to that page and figure out which um, format you need it in. Uh, the last benefit perk I wanna move on to is obtaining uh, or keeping SSDI at 62 versus collecting retirement. This is pretty key for anybody uh, who gets, uh, is approaching their retirement age, um, which is actually called your, your full retirement age or FRA. And if you go on to your SSA My Account, and the link there is at the bottom of the slide, open up your My Account, you will find out what your full retirement age is. It could be 66, it could be 66 and a half, it could be 67. Um, but if, you're a, if you've acquired a disability very close to age 62, you wanna think about maybe applying for disability instead of collecting early. The earliest you can collect is age 62. If you simply collect early at 62, you're penalized 25%. And you have to keep that benefit in place for the rest of your life. Whereas if you apply for disability and are awarded that benefit, you're allowed to keep that benefit up to your full retirement age. It's always about the same as what your benefit would be at that age. And then it simply converts to a retirement benefit. So you're getting the maximum you can and it continues for the rest of your life as a retirement benefit. So there's no penalty whatsoever. And the beauty here is, is that um, Social Security relaxes the rules at the ages of 50, 55, and 60 increasingly. When you reach 60, it is um, really the, the least uh, stringent rules will apply to you. They favor your age, your work history, uh, your education, and so on. And the fact that you, they figure you really would have, might have a hard time adjusting to any other work. And if you can't do the work you're doing, um, then it's easier uh, to be approved, okay? Now, some people go ahead and apply for disability while they're also collecting an early benefit at 62 or 63 or whatever. There are ways to reset the clock on that. Um, and uh, if you need help with that, you can, you can call us and I may be able to walk you through that. Okay, we're gonna flip now to the pitfalls. The first thing I wanna talk about is the SSI one third reduction. So this only applies if you're an SSI recipient. What happens is social security will reduce your benefit by one third. The benefit currently is $914. And if you're living with family or friends or neighbors or whoever, and you're not participating in helping with the household expenses, they're going to reduce your benefits by one third. Well, the thing is they ask this question in the financial screening before you're approved. And at that time you might answer, well, no, I don't help with the household finances because how could you, you don't have income. So, what you need to do is try and answer that question proactively by indicating that you intend to pay your fair share. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details here about how fair share is calculated because there's actually two methods because on our social security webpage, which I've listed here, that we have a um, a guide, a written guide, and I've also uh, developed a video on this topic, and it will tell you exactly how to assert that you are paying your fair share, and you do this to avoid this one-third reduction in your benefit. 
Okay, so there's a resource here for you to get more information on. I, I know that one can sound confusing. The next pitfall can be overpayments. I would be willing to bet everybody here has heard about those. Somebody's got a horror story about the $900,000 overpayment they got. Um, they're, they're very common, unfortunately, and they can occur quite easily for many reasons. I'm gonna tell you how to avoid them. They often occur because you have failed to change your address. Now, how simple is that? Well, if they cannot contact you and they send you a letter and you don't respond to it, they're going to figure you're lost in the system and they're gonna probably stop your benefit or they may continue your benefit when they shouldn't be because maybe there's a piece of information you need to give them and you haven't. You see how this can create a problem for them? So you need to be proactive and the moment your address or phone number change occurs, you need to notify them. Best way to do that is to contact your local office. Okay, you used to be able to do it online. I don't believe you can do that now. The second way you can um, have an overpayment is with an increase in earned um, or unearned income or resources. Now, again, this is when you're an SSI recipient where income and resources count. And this is where income or resources have not been reported to Social Security or perhaps they discovered a resource that you have um, that you didn't even think to report to them. And now you shouldn't have been qualifying for the benefit. You've been getting it for two years and now you owe them you know, $20,000 back. So full disclosure is very important with social security, letting them know upfront everything that's going on, okay? And if anything changes, you need to report it. And you need to document that you've reported because sometimes they'll not make a note of it and you need a, a, a log. I recommend people keep a notebook of all social security communications. You know, on this date, I notified them of X, okay? Another thing that can occur is your, li your living arrangement can change. You know, you may go where you are living independently to moving home and you've been getting the full benefit but you didn't report that you moved home and now they haven't been able to ask about your living arrangement and you know, household expenses. So you could end up in an overpayment there or your marital status could change things if you haven't reported it. Um, and of course, having more resources over the allowable limit, which is $2,000, that could create a problem. But number five is very common. This is where social security actually makes a mistake. It's their error. And you'll get these horrifying letters saying you owe them this outrageous amount of money. And you'll wonder, well, how did that happen? And the communications with social security may be very vague. Their letters are often vague and getting an answer to the question may be hard. Now there are ways to appeal these overpayments and we have information in our office that we can share with you on how to do that. But the point is everything with social security is appealable. So if you get an overpayment letter, be prepared to appeal and there's a chance it could be social security's error, okay? Okay. You got about 10 minutes. Is that before? And I already put oh. that in somewhere else. Okay. Is that before Q and A? Can I ask Robert about the number? Uh, yes. Well, it's before uh, two forty-five. Okay. Can you mute who's ever not muted, please? Thank you. Okay. So anyway, understanding the income and resource limits is very important um, because children, for example, are dependent on their parents' income when they get SSI. If the parent's income goes up and they're not notified of this, it could cause an overpayment because maybe they shouldn't be getting the benefit anymore. Um, for adults, it can occur if your resources go over 2000, uh, it could end up terminating your benefit um, and uh, other sorts of income, earned or unearned income, okay? So the main takeaway though, is that SSI is calculated monthly. 
And any change can change it from month to month and they need to be notified every month of what's going on if there are changes, okay? Now the third pitfall is neglecting to keep your disability well documented for the review. So the reviews will occur um, every one, three, five, or seven years. And this depends on um, when Social Security thinks your condition will improve enough to work. Now you may have a disability where you'll never be able to work. And of course that will be, um, sorry, <laughs> that will be noted by Social Security. You still have to go through these reviews though, okay? so. You can look at your notice of award when you were first approved, and there's a paragraph in there that will tell you in how many years you will be reviewed. But the takeaway here is, is that you have to keep going to the treating sources that originally documented your disability, because without that come the review, they're going to want to collect the, the new records. And if they see you haven't been getting any treatment, it's going to be a, a kind of a a disconnect for them. And they're gonna expect that you will have needed um, conditional, it will set up the perception that you are better, that you have medically improved. So even if you have not improved <laughs> or, or there's nothing more the doctor can do, it's still important to see them or a therapist or the doctor, whoever, regularly, and I, I recommend twice a year, to report to them what's going on in terms of your limitations, even if there's nothing more they can do for, for you. And that's mainly to keep it documented. Um, and I believe this is the last pitfall is neglecting to obtain benefits planning when you go to work while receiving a benefit. And I, I have mentioned benefits planning and it is a real thing. And it's an important thing because this one hour, we've only talked about a small piece of the employment supports. And already it can, I'm sure it can feel very overwhelming about how to use them, how to, how, to, how to implement them. But this is where you need the benefits planning to sit down and say, you have X amount of social security income, this employment support will help you and this is how, and make use of those supports. And in the same way, for example, they'll help you know how to report your earned income so you don't end up with an overpayment. Um, but mainly so you can make the most use out of these employment supports. Now in Virginia, we have uh, what are called community work incentives coordinators, and I've given you the link to Infinity Services, which uh, is the vendor for that. There's also a center in uh, Tidewater called the Independent Center that conducts benefits planning. And then lastly, if you are a client of DARS, the Department of Aging, and rehabilitative services. Uh, they offer, um, in fact, for anybody who's on SSI or SSDI, they automatically do benefits planning. So be sure to see your counselor to obtain that. Okay, so I believe that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm going to switch quickly to any questions in the chat. Cassidy, do you see any questions in the chat box? There are presently no questions in the chat. Okay. But would if anybody, anybody like, in the session would like to speak up, you are more than welcome to. Yeah, any questions? Like no one's got a question for you. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let me end with this then. Um, thanking you certainly for being a part of this year's Disability Summit, um, but also to tell you that at the Disability Law Center, um, we provide a lot of information referral and guidance around disability related issues and specifically around social security disability benefits uh, Medicaid waivers, uh, overpayments, things like that. So if you have a question or concern about this, understand that we cannot represent you in these matters, but we can provide some support and guidance. And you can do that in one of two ways. And I believe this is on the last slide. You can call our toll-free number, 
Uh, if you're local, we have a local number and let ask to speak to an advocate. But you have to do that on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Otherwise, you can use our Get Help online questionnaire. You fill out a form at dlcb.org slash get help. And the link to that is right there. And when you do that, you'll complete a questionnaire that will help us understand the issue. It will be assigned to the subject matter expert on that topic. If it's social security related, it'll either come to me. If it's one of these uh, what we call post entitlement questions involving work incentives and things like that, it may go to another advocate, but you'll be in good hands um, with the folks we have to to answer your questions. OK, so there was a question in the chat by Lori. She was asking about uh, how to get a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes. OK, my understanding is, is that both the recording and the PowerPoints will be available to all registrants at some point. Can you confirm that, uh, Cassidy? If it's something that you want sooner, would you email me, Lori? Uh, yep, Sarah says the slides are in the conference app. You can find them there. Uh, but Lori, feel free to email me. And um, you and I have had a connection and I can forward the link to the PowerPoint to you. Any other questions? Thank you, Sarah, for answering that. That is very helpful in the uh, in the chat. Um, but it doesn't look like there's any other questions in our chat. Great. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and let you get ready for the next session. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and your interest. I hope it's been helpful. Um, I recognize that the material is kind of dense, <laughs> but um, there are lots of ways to expand on your knowledge. So uh, everyone take care and thanks again.